On March 12, uh, 1942, an emotionally charged moment, President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered General Douglas MacArthur to leave the Philippines where he had been commanding a feudal defensive against the overwhelming and relentless Japanese army. As a result of that, he had to obey the order that meant leaving his friend General Jonathan Wainwright and 36,000 men stranded on the Patan Peninsula. Short on supplies, they were already on half rations. A crushing defeat at the hands of the brutal enemy was inevitable. Take a look at this. Your adopted land was in flames. The war you had predicted was underway. Retreat from Manila to Batan. From Batan to Corregidor. The heartbreaking road of defeat. Here on the rock in Manila Bay, you met your darkest hour. Ordered by Roosevelt to proceed to Australia, you refused to go. You had sworn to defend the Philippines. How could you leave your troops in their hour of crisis? But the senior officers insisted. And finally, you consented to leave. To General Wainwright, summoned from Bataan, you made a solemn promise. I shall return. Those are really the only kind of words that he could say from a situation like that, I shall return. Because as a military officer, he was trained to stick by his men, and the thought of abandoning his post tore him up on the inside. But he had his orders, he had to go, and while boarding the boat to leave, he turned to view the once lush shoreline that was now cratered by months of shelling, and he thought of the men and their fate in the Japanese torture camps. He was full of both grit and he was choked with emotion. He was overcome with the fact that he was trained to get his men out of trouble, only to be helplessly removed without being able to do anything. And that is why his farewell was simply, I shall return. Well, in our passage this morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to the book of Acts. Because that very same kind of emotion is going to be lacing Paul's words. Because he has to do what none of us necessarily like to do, and that's having to say goodbyes. It is very difficult to say goodbye. There's emotion attached to it. There's time that has been spent. There's memories that have been made. And then there is that difficulty of having to say, okay, I will see you later. But that is, of course, what has been going on as Paul is preparing to lead and leave the church in Ephesus. He knows he's leaving them vulnerable, by the way, to attacks of false teaching. Just like MacArthur knew that the men would be left to the torture of the Japanese people. Paul here knows that when he's going to be leaving that church, after he's poured his heart into it, after he's taught them so many things, he knows that once he walks out the door of that place and once he begins to travel by sea, that eventually something is going to happen. There is going to be an attack. And so he knows they'll be facing spiritual oppression. But unlike MacArthur, he cannot promise to return to defend them. In fact, he knows that he will never see them again. Imagine saying goodbye to someone that you know you will never see again. This then is Paul's final farewell, and that's the text that we are going to be working through today, the rest of chapter 20. And so as we begin to look at this, I'd like to go through, if you have your outline this morning, the geographical survey from Troas to Miletus. That is going to be where Paul is going to be taking us. And so if you see the map there, you will see exactly what we're going to be dealing with. Paul is getting ready. He has got his stuff packed. And he's getting ready to go from Troas to Miletus. Miletus. 
And you will notice in the next map that this is, of course, an area in which he has to travel uh, into, once again, the sea. This is an area in which Paul is at a peninsula. He's getting ready to travel through that. Now, Paul is not traveling alone. He is going to be having some representatives with him. He has completed a one-week stay in Troas, and Paul journeys on to Miletus. And this, if you can see from the map, is a small port town where he is going to say goodbye to his friends in Ephesus. He is traveling with a group of representatives from several of the churches that are gathered around that area. And if you have your notes with you this morning, I invite you to look at the representatives as they came from various churches in Europe and Asia, and they basically had a twofold mission. Take a look at it. Number one, if you've been with us, they were going to collect the money that their congregations had donated. They had taken a congregational uh, offering, and now they were going to take that offering and then, two, deliver it to the needy believers in Jerusalem. And that, of course, we remember back in Acts chapter 20, down in verse 4, if you can look at there, several men were traveling with him. They were Soptar, son of Frishas, and Berea, from Berea, Aristicus and Secundus, from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Tychicus, and Troophemes from the province of Asia. And look at it, they went on ahead and they waited for us at Troas. Because after the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them in Troas where we stayed a week. And so his idea is to take this money and get to Jerusalem. In fact, this is something that Paul talked about in his letter to the Romans. Look behind me at Romans chapter 5, verse 25. Listen to the very words as it transposes from what we just read. But before I came or before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. It's so cool to see how the letters overlap. As you're looking in Acts, you're seeing it come out in the letters that Paul's writing. So Paul is getting ready for a four-day voyage. Luke, who was also a member of the traveling party, describes this four-day voyage, beginning in verse number 13 of chapter 20. Notice it carefully. Paul went by land to Assos, where he had arranged for us to join him while we traveled by ship. He joined us there, and we sailed together to Malayan. The next day, we sailed past the island of Chios. The following day, we crossed to the island of Samos, and a day later, we arrived at Miletus. Now look at verse 16. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus. For he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus, asking them to come and meet him. So Paul feels that Provoked by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of him, he needs to be able to meet with these elders. These are the individuals that are leading the churches back there that are going to be facing all these difficulties. And so Paul wants to meet with them and and give them something that will stick in their minds because of the fact that he knows that they are going to be attacked. It's almost as if a church is saying to the elders of a local congregation, listen, the days are going to be difficult and you need to have some words, some words of wisdom to be able to help defeat the enemies that will attack the church. By the way, anything that is thriving and is from God will always be attacked. Always. If you're walking with the Lord this morning, you can be guaranteed that your life will be attacked most likely on a regular basis. 
Because the reality is, is that when we are following God, when we are doing what he tells us to do, the reality is, is that Satan will try to dismantle it. And of course, this is the situation. The time has come for Paul to say his farewell to the Ephesians. And he plans to speak to the elders of the church. Now, he does not speak to them in Ephesus, but he, he calls them to come to Miletus. Let's take a look at this map. This is the journey that these elders would have taken from Ephesus to Miletus. Miletus was some 50 miles, 80 kilometers from Ephesus. Verse 17 tells us this. Now, again, the question naturally is, is why is Paul doing this? Why is he having them come from Ephesus to Melita? And Paul gives, Luke gives us Paul's motivation in verse 16 so that he might not have to spend time in Asia for he was hastening to be in Jerusalem. So it's a time issue. And so this is exactly what is happening. Paul's reason, look at your notes, to meet in Miletus instead of Ephesus is dealing with timing. Look at the first arrow. The first reason it was to save time for him to reach Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. Secondly, he would then have more time to edify the elders. So what Paul is doing is he's being careful he could have gone to Ephesus, but he would have been sidetracked. He would not have been able to have the time that was necessary for him to give the warnings that were needed for this particular area. And so the question naturally comes, what would Paul say to these men whom he's nurtured from spiritual infancy? Listen to what Chuck Swindoll writes on this. Surely as Paul looks out on the small group of men, he recalls the joyful day when each one of them embraced Jesus as his Lord. Memories flood his thoughts as he formulates what will become his last and most vital words to them. Words from a father to the sons that he knows he will never see again, unquote. Don't you just feel the nostalgia? You just feel the emotion that here he is. He's brought these individuals to where they are and God has worked in their lives and and now Paul has to say goodbye, knowing that he's never going to see them again. And so we begin then with the second part in our outline, and that's the expositional study from Paul to the elders. And that brings us to the characteristics, by the way, of a healthy ministry. I want to say a word here. God has chosen to use his church to edify his people. And the way that he edifies his people is with the teaching of his word. It is not preaching what is popular. It is not preaching what is the latest topic at the time. It is literally teaching the pages of scripture. And in Paul's day, it was already the Old Testament scriptures and some of the things that he has taught other churches at the time. It was the edification through specifically the word of God. The emphasis is on the preaching of the word of God. Please don't misunderstand that. We grow spiritually when we are involved in the words that come from the pages of Scripture. I remember a pastor friend of mine one time was preaching in a very conservative church and the elders that had eventually come to be began to be involved in some of the social issues that were going on of the day, and they wanted him to move from his expository preaching to what was known as the social topical issues of the day. And this friend of mine who was a phenomenal, phenomenal, is a phenomenal preacher, said, listen, if you preach the Bible eventually you get to the topics. Eventually you cover the things. I am going to preach the word of God. Well, eventually the elders won out and basically uh, he ended up leaving the church because he was no longer allowed to preach the Bible verse by verse. And as a result of that, the church 
was crumbling. You see, God has chosen this method to edify his people. And so Paul believes that this is of the paramount importance. Now, again, Paul is going to begin slowly. He takes the elders back to the days when he lived and worked among them. In fact, look at verse 18. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. You always preach under pressure. Verse 20, I never shrank back. I love that term. We'll look at it. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. That is an important text. There are all kinds of things that preachers can shrink back from. Pressures to tell the truth or to tell it in a different way. Paul says, I did not shrink back from telling you the words of this book. And folks, those are the kinds of pressures that are on the churches today to somehow soft pedal the gospel. And Paul says, quite frankly, I did not shrink back, either publicly or in your homes. Now, from this conversation, we see two words that describe Paul's ministry. The first one, number one, that we see is this little Greek word, lockdown, tears. The word lockdown literally means emotional weeping, sorrow, anxiety. It is the same word that is used to describe the time in which we have the one verse in the Bible where it says, Jesus, what? Wept. Tears. It is the idea of the heartfelt part of his teaching. And then the second little Greek word there is the word trials. It's the word pierosmos, and it literally means the temptation. It means he was walking under a burden. It is something that befell him. So with those two words in mind, we can see that the shape Paul's ministry, and it gives us some characteristics that will help us to emulate what a healthy ministry is. So let's begin to do that. Let's look at number one in your notes here. What is the first necessary need in a healthy ministry? Is number one, Paul endured his tests of the flesh. He endured the tests that were given to him that would attack his flesh. And we can just see it. It says in the text that he endured the test of laziness. That's the next part of your notes. He said, I set foot in the province of Asia until now. In other words, from that time on, he kept working diligently among the people. And then notice the next one, he endured the test of pride. He says, I have done the work humbly. He safeguarded the effectiveness of the church as a whole. And then look at the third one, he endured the test of discouragement. That's a big one. He says, with tears and with trials. Those two little Greek words describe what every healthy ministry goes through. He never gave up to the pounding shouts to give up. And believe me, those shouts are strong. No matter how many walls he faced. And then he next endured the test of fear. He says, I never shrank back of telling you what you needed to hear. There are some ministers that are scared to teach the Bible. Because sometimes when you teach the Bible, I would say all the time, that you teach the Bible, you're going to confront something, right? You're going to confront sin, and, and people don't like that. People don't like to be confronted with their sin. That's why some people will leave churches that preach the Bible, because they don't want to feel bad. 
And Paul says, I didn't fear that. I didn't fear losing my job. I didn't fear the fact that I wasn't going to be liked. I didn't fear that the elders were going to say, okay, uh, you need to be a little bit more positive. He didn't fear it. He didn't shrink back. The truth, no matter what, would be declared by Paul, even when it hurts and even when it's unpopular. We have the saying, we preach the Bible in season and out of season, when it's popular, when it's not popular, when it's tough and when it's joyful. And then the next test he endured was the test of fads. He employed only helpful techniques in his ministry, techniques that would edify and equip, not just impress. And so those were the things that he did. He endured those those tests of the flesh, which brings us to number two. Paul's ministry was based on solid Christian doctrine. Doctrine. Referring to his teaching ministry, he says that he declared what was profitable. Look at verse 21. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. Here it is. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. That does not happen with easy believism teaching. That does not happen with topical feel-good messages. It happens when you confront the very word of God. And this, of course, was the issue. So Paul speaks of three action verbs. You can see it right there in verse 21 that were essential to the gospel. Look at them in your notes. The first one is that you preach the Bible so it eventually cuts to something and you begin to repent of your sin, the repenting of sin, and then, of course, turning to God. And then thirdly, having faith in the Lord Jesus. That was the whole idea. And by the way, that's not just for people to become saved. That's for the saved. That's where we are today. I want to know when the Bible tells me that I'm doing something wrong so that I can repent. And when I do, I turn back to God and say, Lord, I need you. I can't do anything without you. And as a result of that, I have faith, not in my works, but I have faith in Christ who's forgiven me of my sin. So Paul endured the test of the flesh. It was based on solid doctrine. And then thirdly, Paul's ministry was free of deception and personal politics. And you'll see how that comes in here in a moment. We have seen politics come into the church and wreak havoc. We've lost people from the church because of politics or because of issues. So concluding his recollections of his days in Ephesus, look at what he says. We're going to be skipping around some verses, but we'll come back to them. Look at verse 26. Drop down to verse 26. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I did not shrink, there's our word again, from declaring all that God wants you to know. Look at that. Paul did not hold back in declaring the whole purpose of God. In other words, there was no excuse for the people to misunderstand what Paul was saying. It was all made very clear for everyone to see. That little word there, shrink, is the word postello, and it literally means to pause, to hold back in uncertainty or unwillingness. I wasn't resistant. I bolded forward. I told the truth. And because of his not shrinking back, Paul was was very careful to do two things. Look at your notes. He refrained from double talk and false information. And that's always the issue when you deal with any type of political or issue that goes on around you. Paul was innocent of the blood of all men. Listen to this. On the great judgment day, none of the lost from this territory shall be able to point to Paul and say he was guilty. 
guilty for not telling them. In other words, when they get into heaven or maybe they go to hell and they say, well, I was never told, they won't be able to use that excuse. They have no excuse because they've been told. And what they do with what they have been told is what they are held accountable with. So even personal politics didn't enter into his teaching. He declared to them the whole purpose of God, period. I think we spend way too much time fighting around peripheral issues. Not that those issues aren't important. I don't want to say that some of the stuff that concerns us that we vote on isn't important, but sometimes I think it takes up too much and people put too much emphasis when they really should be focusing upon the gospel. And here it was with Paul. He declared to them the whole purpose of God, not just the parts that could win votes. He balanced his topics between the sweet and the sour, the teaching of all of God's truth. Notice also what Paul doesn't mention, again from Chuck Swindoll, Paul doesn't reminisce on the signs of health that we normally look for, such as spiraling growth figures, impressive building programs. Neither does he use this opportunity to get back at those who injured him. Instead, as he reflects on the past, he emphasizes on positive qualities of the ministry so that the elders will continue his legacy into the future, a future that for Paul is clouded with uncertainty, unquote. And so in B, in your notes, there is the admission of an uncertain future. And in this portion of his talk, Paul ushers his friends into his heart of hearts. In fact, he reveals his deepest thoughts and his solid faith. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, and now I am bound by the Spirit. I would underline those three words, or four words, bound by the Spirit. I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Look at this, verse 24. This is to be our attitude. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. Paul had a single-minded devotion to one's life purpose. Despite the dangerous waters ahead, he doesn't waver from his decision to travel to Jerusalem. In fact, in the text there that I had you underline, he is bound in spirit to fulfill his ministry. Let's take a look at that word bound. It's the word deo. It means to tie. It means to bind. It means to make something secure. Really, it has the idea of being knit to something. The word bound is commonly used to refer to physical binding with chains or ropes. It's used figuratively here to speak of the powerful tie of the marriage bond. It's the glue. It's the idea of coming together. In fact, look behind me at Romans chapter 7, verse 2. For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her, there it is, to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So Paul is talking about something that is permanent. Paul uses the physical word for bound as well as spiritual. Hold your place in the book of Acts. And turn back in your Bibles to, or forward in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. And I want you to notice in 2 Timothy 2, verse number 8. And I want you to pay very close attention to the wording that he's using here. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8. Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. Now notice carefully. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. Go over to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy in verse 15. Again, notice this binding idea. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. And of course, the familiar words, all Scripture is breathed out or inspired by God is useful to teach us what is true, look at it, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Here it is. God uses it, the word, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. It's the book. It's the preaching out of the book. This is what we are to be doing. It is to be the Word and nothing but the Word. So look at your notes. Paul's sense of duty and responsibility was to his master. And then the unchained Word of God. It's not bound up. The Word of God is loose to be able to reach the hearts of those who need to be trained by it. And both of these things drove him on his way to Jerusalem. Not knowing specifically what would happen to him once he arrived there, Paul didn't wait for the forecast to improve. He didn't wait for it to be better. He launches off into God's will. And he knows that when a believer follows God closely, difficulties will lie ahead. Uncertainties will taunt your soul. So how can Paul be so brave with these two realities confronting his future? Really, it's only by focusing on Christ rather than himself that he can ever possibly be able to deal with the attacks on his own heart and his mind. Again, look at verse 24, back to our text. Verse 24, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And then these words here, look at it carefully. And I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. That's prophetic. One purpose propels Paul's life to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Dr. Al Moeller, one of the wonderful preachers that preached along uh, in the seminars with R.C. Sproul and MacArthur and others, he writes these words which I thought were very interesting. Paul understands his position before the eternal God. Throughout his letters, he describes himself as a slave and a servant of God. He expects to suffer greatly, yet nothing will stop his journey because the Spirit of God compels him and constrains him. Paul will seize every opportunity to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And the mission he has received from Jesus Christ motivates him into action. Unquote. So then that brings us to see in your notes, and that's the perils then of a growing church. Remember I said a healthy church is always attacked. Realizing that difficulties lurk just around the corner for the Ephesian believers as well, Paul gives them three warnings. Three warnings of the dangers that are ahead. These are dangers, by the way, we need to watch for in the 21st century church here at Woodville. Let's take a look at them. 
Number one, the peril of personal blind spots. The peril of personal blind spots. Verse 28. Verse 28 of chapter 20. So guard yourselves and God's people. Notice the yourselves are before God's people. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church. And then, so we understand the importance of the church purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. Every elder, and I'm one of the elders, every elder should have a tingle go down their back. Look at that. We are to guard ourselves, guard God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock because he purchased it with his own blood. Again, he warns himself to look to themselves first. Literally, be on guard for yourselves is how it's literally translated in the original language. Be on guard for yourselves. Good health of the church today cannot be taken for granted as good health tomorrow. I'm going to say something that's very important. We are receiving wonderful blessings because we have godly leadership here at Woodville Community Church. And one of the things that we have to be careful of, it only takes a time of having the wrong leadership for a church to fall into terrible times. Because we are an elder-run church, the pastor has limited resources in the sense because he gives accountability to the elders. Elders can decide they can be strong enough to say, just as my friend experienced, if you don't do what we think you ought to do, suck it up or go somewhere else. And that's exactly what ended up happening. It was a catastrophe. It split the church completely up, by the way. The elders did not see fit enough to trust in the leadership of their pastor enough to know that they themselves were the ones that needed the work. Listen to this. If the elders neglect their spiritual leadership role, the flock may stray from the Lord. And sadly, the Ephesian church did stray from the Lord. So what Paul just warned them about right here actually did happen. You want to see it? Turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation, chapter 2. It begins with verse number four. Jesus is speaking, by the way, since it's his church. He has the right to be able to speak it. In verse one, he says, write this letter to the angel of the church of the Ephesus. That's literally, this is the message. This is the, the leadership. This is the pastor and the elders. Verse four, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first, exclamation point. And then he goes, verse five, and says, look how far you have fallen. He says, turn back to me and do the works that you did at first. The faithfulness of the teaching and the preaching of the Bible, loving each other, serving if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. And this, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen the lampstand get removed. In the case of my friend, it didn't take very long, only a few months before that church eventually dropped down to a church that had over 200 people down to a church of maybe 20 or 25 when God removes his lampstand from a church, you'll know it. You will know it. It is no longer effective. Somehow the church in Ephesus got the idea that as the leadership 
continued throughout the years that somehow they needed to do it differently or somehow do it freshly in a different way that it compromised what God had already been doing there. It's not that difficult. It's been happening since the time the church was founded. We teach and preach the Bible, right? It seems really simple. And yet the 21st century church has found other things to do besides that. And take the emphasis off that. That brings us to number two. Without warning, the church could slip into the crevice of rigid legalism or comfortable apathy. Apathy is the worst. Number two, the peril of external and internal attack. This is what we have to be careful of. Look at verse 29. Back to Acts 20, verse 29. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves, translated also ravenous wolves, will come in among you. That's from the outside coming in. After I leave, not sparing the flock. Stop there. Vicious wolves, savage wolves, they come in among you. That's the dangerous part. They're, they, they become part of the church body. These are those who stir up trouble. Look behind me at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, the words of Jesus, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. In verse 30, Paul says that there may be somebody or some that are already in the church. Look at it. Verse 30, even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. This threat is more insidious and difficult to spot, an internal threat of false teaching that subtly works to lead the sheep astray. It doesn't happen overnight. It is not overt. It is very subtle. And you need men and women with discernment to be able to sense when something's not right, when something isn't as it ought to be. This is why the spiritual gift of discernment is so important for the church, especially today, because it's subtle. Look again behind me at 1 Timothy chapter 1. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. And now we get some names. You ever wonder about people, you know, people say, don't put people's names Don't say people's names in public. Well, here we got one in Scripture, right? Imanus and Alexander are two examples. I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so that they might learn not to blaspheme God. They needed to do church discipline. And so he names them, and he literally uses some pretty strong language, throws them out. He throws them out. Because if he didn't throw them out, what did he imply there? That they end up blaspheming God, right? They blaspheme God by allowing them to stay. It's not easy. It's not pleasant. It's not popular. But yet this is the reality of of what Paul is trying to warn them about. And then notice number three, the third warning, the peril of financial greed. Chapter 20, let's first look at verse 31. Watch out, remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. Drop down to verse 33. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Just let that sink where it will. Paul reminds them of his high standards of accountability. His example in the deep heartfelt care that was undertook as this church planner. He was a missionary, a pastor. 
And Paul's life displayed a desire for the glory of Christ. Paul wants these Ephesian elders to emulate what kind of financial responsibility that they need to have, so he commits them to the Lord. Look at verse 32. Back to verse 32. And I now, I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all of those he has set apart for himself. So there's the message that Paul had given them. We're brought then to D, which is the scene of the final farewell. This is the the hard part. With his flags of warning raised, the elders are now committed to God. Paul's ready to depart, but before boarding the ship, look at verse 36. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. And they were sad most of all because he had said that he would never see them again. And they escorted him down to the ship. A few years prior, he had come to them as a stranger. And now he leaves them as an eternal friend. And look at your notes. Within this farewell, there are two realities. Two realities. Number one, the tearful reality, he would never see them again. Number two, a transforming encouragement, he would write them a letter. He would write them a letter. And of course, it will be the letter that is penned by Paul as he writes to the Ephesians they get to not just have Paul for a moment, but they get to have him permanently in a sense because God writes through Paul into this letter to the Ephesians, which is so profound. And so they get to have his letter, a letter that would penetrate them, by the way, and all of the churches to come. So with pain and sorrow come help and affirmation A written treaty penned with the very breath of God by a missionary in chains, by the way, when he wrote that letter to his beloved children. So let's take a look as we close with some practical significance. From then to now. From Paul's example, we have to keep two principles in mind. Number one, here it is. Reflecting on the past calls for honesty and objectivity so that we can learn from it. Look at it again. We need to reflect on the past for honesty and objectivity to see the truth of the things there so that we can learn from it. That's why we have a past. Life grinds to a halt when people don't know how to relate to their past. And we need to be ready to review and release the past so that God can transform our behaviors with their ability to hope for a future. You can't hope for a future if you're tied with all of the guilt and the problems of the past. The past is just what, they, what it is. It's the past. The Bible even speaks so much of it where it says that the Lord takes our sins and drops them into the deepest depths. Number two, enjoying success includes constant awareness of perils. Spiritual health today is no guarantee of spiritual health tomorrow. Again, we're only as healthy as we are committed to strong biblical leadership. We need to consciously and consistently sustain the character traits that foster holiness. So although this farewell is often teary, it can be a milestone moment, as all tears are. It's a time when we can learn from the past, and when we do that, we can forever change the future. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning for the truth and the power of your word. Father, we know that through the pages of Scripture, all that is necessary for us to live and to grow is contained in the 66 books that you've given us.
We pray, Father, that you will continue to help to edify us. Help us to realize, Father, how important it is that we meet regularly so that we can gain the teaching that is necessary, that we can enjoy the worship that we sing together and we enjoy each other, we fellowship with each other and hold each other accountable. All of the things, Father, that makes your church healthy. We pray that you will continue to be with our leaders. Give them wisdom. Give them discernment. Help our congregation to respect our leaders and to continue to give them encouragement because these times are difficult. Things become tricky. But help us, Father, to stay steadfast to the truth of your word. We love you and praise you. It is in the precious name of Jesus Christ we ask it. And all of God's people together said,